Welcome to today's webinar, The Fiscal Benefits of Smart Growth, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infra Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, which is supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and is managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. Today's program is the sixth offering of Planning with Purpose, a smart growth network webinar series on community revitalization. In this series, the Smart Growth Network is sharing new ideas and approaches taken from current planning issues, case studies, that have made us aware of the need to broaden our smart growth lens. We want to share with and learn from you with the hope that together we can create communities of the future that are healthy, equitable, and resilient for everyone. We are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to get smart growth news and information and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also learn about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is the Fiscal Benefits of Smart Growth. You can also search for event number 9210093. So to get started, our guests today are Chris Zimmerman, Arthur Chris Nelson, Kevin Shepard, and Sean Kessel. Christopher Zimmerman is Smart Growth America's Vice President for Economic Development. An economist by training, Chris leads the team that provides quantitative analysis for data-driven policy recommendations, such as modeling the fiscal impact of development patterns and quantifying potential loss of affordable housing from rising real estate values. He leads SGA's Technical Assistance Program for Equitable Transit-Oriented Development and oversees technical assistance for local communities on revitalization in urban, suburban, and rural communities. Prior to joining SGA, Chris was involved in planning, development, housing, and transportation policy for an urban municipality widely recognized as one of the leading models for smart growth in TOD in the US. Through his work as an elected official for 18 years, in Arlington County, Virginia. Arthur Chris Nelson is a professor of urban planning and real estate development at the University of Arizona, where he co-founded the nation's second ranked online Masters of Real Estate Development program. Chris has written more than 20 books and published more than 400 other works and is well known for his work in public finance, smart growth, urban redevelopment and development, transportation and land use planning, and the implications of demographics on America's planning and development policies. Kevin Shepard is the founder and CEO of the Dallas-based Vernundipi, a consulting firm that provides fiscally informed planning design and engagement services that help city leaders cultivate fiscal health and local wealth in their communities. Kevin spent the first 17 years of his career as a civil engineer and later as national director of HDR's community planning practice, where he worked with state and local agencies across the country on sustainable uh, development initiatives and projects. He is the lead facilitator for Vernundity's Cultivate Community Workshop and is the host of the Go Cultivate podcast. He writes and speaks regularly on the resource gap 
fiscally based planning and cultivating self-sustaining local economies and neighborhoods. And finally, Sean Kessel is the, an executive professional adjunct faculty and a small business owner who currently serves as interim commissioner, commissioner at the North Dakota Department of Commerce, where his focus is on economic development and diversity, community development, the state's COVID response and smart community planning. Sean has almost 20 years of experience working at the municipal level of government. He spent nine years in Wahpeton, North Dakota, and almost 10 years in his hometown of Dickinson, North Dakota, as city administrator. These experiences provide an excellent background to lead the state's Main Street initiative. He currently sits on the Empower Commission and has sat on numerous other statewide boards, including the North Dakota League of Cities and the North Dakota Insurance Reserve Fund. Following their discussion, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during their discussion by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And before we get started, uh, we're going to launch a brief poll of our audience today. And it's just a very simple one. Where do you live and work? And you have five options. If you're having trouble responding to it, you may need to exit from full screen mode. And we'll give you a little bit of time to respond. And then we'll turn it over to Chris Zimmerman. So thanks to everybody who is responding. We can see them coming in. Give you a couple more seconds and then we'll close the poll. Okay, and it's very well distributed as always. 34% uh, Mid Atlantic and Northeast, 23% in the South, 21% in the Midwest, 16% in the West, and we have 5% in the international community today. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris Zimmerman. Chris, welcome. Thank you. As Michael said, I'm Chris Zimmerman, and uh, I'm with Smart Growth America, which is pleased to be co-hosting today's webinar with the Smart Growth Network. Uh, and I'm going to ask for confirmation, John, when I if I manage to get my screen up. Still waiting for it? Yeah, I clicked on it, but. Uh, Okay, now I think it's going. A little bit of a lag. Yep, we're seeing your desktop icons. All right. Now let me know if you're seeing the right screen. I'm not seeing the correct screen. I'm seeing your presenter notes. Okay, so we're going to have to change which screen is which. Can I do that with uh, the settings? Or do with I have to change it? With the sharing tab. Yeah, so, no, that's not it. Share screen, the word screen is a drop down. Okay, we got the right one now? Yes. All right, very good, and thank you. So, um, you know, it seems like we always say local government budgets are under a lot of stress these days but surely it's never been more true than today. A significant portion of municipal budgets are affected by the geographic pattern of development, including street construction and maintenance, water and sewer infrastructure, fire protection and police services, solid waste removal, school transportation, and so on. Local governments spend more, both for upfront capital costs and ongoing operations to provide services to their citizens when residents, civic functions, and places of commerce are dispersed far and wide uh, by car only development patterns. On the other hand, there is a fiscal premium to be earned with more compact development, what we call smart growth. And when I say smart growth, I mean that in this case to be shorthand for less car dependent development, closer location of homes, shops, places of work and other activities, generally more walkability. This is something that's been known for a while. Uh, you know, Studies going back to the 1970s have shown the connection between land use development patterns and the cost of providing public infrastructure and services, uh, most of which have you know, come to the same conclusion. 
basically that uh, patterns of development that consume less land for a given population and level activity is going to be associated with lower local government spending on a per capita basis, relative, relatively speaking. Uh, we've known this. And, and yet, we have not typically incorporated this fact in fiscal impact analyses done in connection, for instance, with new development proposals, in comprehensive planning, in zoning, in economic development incentives, or in municipal capital budgets. Governments, especially local and state governments, have a big say in what that development pattern is. They influence heavily what gets built where and how through land use approvals like zoning and building permits and so on, through various incentives that are provided, through infrastructure decisions about where to put things, and where they build their own facilities it has a big effect. And these choices wind up having a big effect on real estate and the return on investment, both for the private sector and on the public side. At Smart Growth America, we've been working for about six, seven years now with communities around the country to quantify this, to figure out what is the net fiscal impact, meaning the difference between the revenue you get from development that pays taxes and the cost of the services you have to provide. We developed a scenario analysis tool uh, that uses a geographically based marginal cost approach to services and infrastructure. And we've been able to work with communities from fairly large metropolitan to very small places. And while the numbers vary, the, um, the, the magnitudes vary, uh, the qualitative res, you know, return is the same. Why, why this matters is a lot of things, but of course there are economic implications. Uh, if you have this information and you incorporate it into policy, you could do a better job of managing your assets, of planning for growth, uh, finding ways to do more with less. It, it could influence land use and transportation planning in a way that it has not. Uh, it could result in more fairness for taxpayers in terms of who's paying what for what. And if uh, it became a routine component of planning and development approvals, it would have a, a lot of benefits. And th that's really the question we want to get at is how do we get to better policy as a matter of practice? How do we apply the knowledge of costs and revenue, revenues associated with development patterns to local planning decisions? So that's the discussion we're going to have today, and we're going to hear from three folks. Uh, first, Chris Nelson, uh, you know, who's here, as you heard, is a professor at the University of Arizona, has done a lot of academic work on this. He's going to give us an overview of principles for achieving local prosperity through smart planning for uh, facilities and local finance. Uh, then we'll go to Kevin Shepard, uh, whose firm Verdunity is based in Dallas, uh, and he's worked with a lot of local governments and uh, you know, brings kind of an engineering consulting perspective to this. And helps them understand how these choices affect uh, their affect their local uh, finances over time. And then we'll go to Sean Kessel, who heads up the uh, Department of Commerce for the state of North Dakota, where uh, Governor Burgum has been making efforts to give uh, uh, municipalities a, a better ways to achieve long-term outcomes. And uh, then we'll, have, we'll open it up for discussion and answer your questions. So I'd like to uh, now turn things over to Chris Nelson. Thank you very much, Chris. So we have two Chris's here. I'm actually uh, Arthur Christian Nelson. I publish as Arthur C. Nelson, uh, but everybody calls me Chris and that's just fine. I'm going to lay out a, uh, an overview perspective of the role of infrastructure planning and finance in achieving smart growth. So the title is Achieving Local Prosperity Through Smart Facility Planning and Finance. And how do I... There we go. Okay, this is new, te new technology for me. I have a, a shakedown cruise going on here. So I'm going to touch on some uh, the key concept, basically, of almost all of my work. I do a lot of fiscal analysis work. I do a lot of impact fees and impact assessment stuff around the country. I'll talk about the cost of inefficient public policy delivery, and I'll talk about the foundations of facility costs. But I want to focus at the end on why we need to achieve uh, efficient land use patterns, efficient facility planning and finance to uh, advance uh, local prosperity. So the key concept uh, is this. Um, 
if high cost development pays less than its true cost, whether through taxes or fees, whatever source, we get more high cost development. Um, if low cost development pays more than its true costs, we get less of it. Now, these are eco economic principles. These are economic truisms. If we get more high cost development than that does not pay its full cost, but less low cost development, we have a fiscal train wreck coming down the road. And we're actually there in many places across the country. Well, so what, you might ask. Um, the point is that by subsidizing high cost development through higher charges on low cost development, we get more high cost development that may not pay its own way, leading to higher fiscal burdens that reduce money for, for local economic development um, and, us, and quality of life, which then leads to local fiscal stress and lower quality of life overall. It's fairly simple. But let me, I'm going to walk through various concepts and how we apply this. Um, first of all, I want to sort of step back and take a, a little look at demographic changes and changes in, in, in community preferences going around the country. Um, like a lot of the panel members, I've been in this business for uh, 40, actually I'm going on 50 years, come to think of it. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes in where people want to live. And the market drives planning, but the market drives facilities, and, and that's okay. I'm a planner, that's okay. But the market is changing. What we're seeing now is that uh, about two thirds of all households want to live in a walkable community with small lots or attached homes. Uh, and this preference, by the way, is a majority across all major demographic groups, including households with children. Now, this didn't used to be the case. Of course, this is almost reverse from what it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. But societies change, preferences change, and now we need, we have a kind of a new reality we have to work towards. And that's showing through in terms of our supply demand mismatch. Now, this particular slide shows the supply of all housing by attached homes, small lot homes, and large lot homes in 2017 from the American housing survey. Um, then here's the, this is the middle of our area, is the demand for these kinds of units, attached, small lot, large lot, demand based on the surveys by the National Association of Realtors uh, and others. Uh, and then the difference, the absorption, is the uh, difference between 2017 and 2038. Now, by the way, the 2038 demand numbers are derived not only from the National Association of Realtors, but also the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. Hey, Chris. So the, yes. Chris, we're getting a request for you to maximize your screen. Can you go to the view menu uh, right above where it says create? It says view. Oh, boy. View. Okay. No, no. Over here, over to the right, over to the left. File, the left. edit, view. File, edit, okay. Then go to view, go to view. No, the view one, the one that says view. No, now you're, there oh, you go. Okay. Oh, view. Okay, there sorry, view. sorry. And go to full screen mode. Keep going down, 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 down. Right, right there, go ahead. Oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I apologize for not doing that. Um, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is far better. Um, so th this particular chart shows the supply of housing by type uh, attached, uh, small lot, large lot. This is the demand for housing by type in 2038 based on National Association of Realtors Survey and Harvard Joint Center Housing Demographic Studies. Uh, and, the, and the difference between 17 and 38 is absorption. We need to build something like uh, 20 some million new attached units, 25 million uh, new uh, small lot units, but we have an oversupply of nearly 20 million homes on large lots. This didn't used to be the case, um, but this is how the markets are changing, and this is the emerging uh, reality. So I'm going to share uh, some uh, density-related uh, differences in cost, the dreaded D density. Um, assume 640 acres of, of land per square mile but only 200 acres are netted out for residential use. And so this is the, 
the units per square mile uh, for the 200 acres. So this is a net uh, density. Uh, some of these might, might look like a lot, but here's the, the breakdown average units per acre for two acre, two units per acre, half acre lots. Um, six and a half units per acre, this is what I call 60s, 70s lots, 7,000 square feet. 15 units per acre, this is lower missing middle housing density, uh, lower density uh, attached to uh, townhouses, 25 to the acre, moderate missing middle housing, just to put it into some emerging parlance. 40 units per acre, 1,000 uh, uh, square feet per unit, upper missing middle housing. I'll show you what that means here. So this is half acre lots. And this is 60, 70, 7,000 square foot lots. And here is various stages of uh, missing middle housing that uh, Dan Parolik, who wrote a book on this earlier this year, uh, got into. Lower missing middle, about 15 units per acre. That's this group here. Detached homes, uh, duplexes, townhouses, uh, moderate missing middle, 25 per acre. These are walk-ups, uh, townhouses, upper missing middle, which is uh, low-rise apartments. Notice that no building is over three floors. No building is over three floors. So you can get 40 to the acre, walkable communities at, in, in a situation where you really wouldn't under you really, you really wouldn't see that as high density. Now let's talk about value of by density and let's let's take a fresh look. I did not know this until I looked at the most recent uh, 2019 American Housing Survey. Uh, this is a screenshot. Uh, this is the mean value of homes by home type, one detached, that's single family detached, one attached, that's townhouse, two to four per structure, five to nine per structure, 50 or more per structure, Look at, what, what, look at what's going on here. These are owner-occupied, owner-occupied values. $334,000 is the national mean for detached homes. Attached homes, townhouses is a slightly more, about the same. Two to four units is actually more. Five to, seven, five to nine units, these are townhouse. These next two are townhouse types. Uh, these are, uh, this one is more than the detached. This one's a little less. Uh, and the 20 to 49, this is sort of up, upscale the development, upscale owner occupied, it's more than detached. Now, 20 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, this would have been reversed. All of these would have been lower than detached, but detached is losing favor in the market. And as a consequence, people are moving towards a higher density because that's what they want. They want the walkability, they want whatever else they want. The population is changing in its, uh, in its preferences for housing. And here's, what, how it, here's how it shows up in terms of um, the overall um, uh, differences in, in, in values per, per acre. So at two units per acre, let's assume $450,000 per home. Uh, now this particular slide here didn't show the density for detached. So I'm gonna assume 450 per home for density. For, so for two homes, that's $900,000 per acre in total, uh, total density. Um, and then six and a half uh, per acre is a uh, uh, two point one million dollars, two point two million dollars in total value per acre. Fifteen gives us five million dollars. Twenty-five gets us eight point eight million dollars. Forty gets us twelve million dollars per acre of land value. This is important because the more value we get per acre, the more capacity we have to pay the bills and maybe even save some money, which shows up. Uh, a little bit here, we're going to move from this slide to another slide, a couple of slides. And this slide here shows the vehicle miles traveled per person by density. As density increases from half acre to upper missing middle, that's that low, low rise three, four max, uh, we get uh, vehicle miles traveled per person going down from about 30 per person to about, about 14 per person. And you can see the reduction in vehicle miles traveled. This is because you're closer to things here. You can walk to more things. Up here, you're farther away from things. You have to drive more. Uh, and the same situation with water consumption. As the lot size increases, water consumption increases. This is data from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, up until about some point where you kind of flatten out. But water is a very big issue in the West, right, where I'm living these days. Uh, and we're finding that we need to change our land use patterns to conserve water. Uh, and it's, it's more than just 
uh, serving water at the tap, it's serving water by changing our land use patterns. And then here's an interesting study from Michigan State University uh, a few years ago. It looks at the, uh, the, uh, the density related water to wastewater life cycle costs. These are annualized costs per unit at different lot sizes, basically from about one, uh, one fifth of an acre to almost one per acre. Uh, right around here, uh, a little less than a half an acre lot, uh, we have break even. That is to say that we're, our revenues in this case, the study from Michigan State, this is a simulation study, shows that we're generating just as many, just as much revenue from homes as, as our expenses. At the higher density level, we're generating $94 more per unit uh, than it costs. Uh, and at the higher, at the lower density, the larger lot, we're actually spending $167 more per unit than it costs. The trouble is that if we have average cost pricing, that means all of these lots here are basically, say, use, we're using those savings here and subsidizing the costs here to subsidize these lifestyles. Uh, and this is common in uh, utility financing. Unbeknownst to them, they're not aware of this, uh, but we need to get the word out more and more about this being the effect, because here's the effect. We are using the savings from higher density, the lower cost, to subsidize the cost of higher, uh, a larger lot size, lower density. And as a consequence, we would subsidize more higher cost development. Uh, and that's, is a, uh, that's the path to a train wreck. And then here's another way to look at this um, in terms of the average cost per acre. Now, using a simulation study, um, I need to move things around here on my own screen, thank you. So using a simulation study that uh, I developed with some engineers and, and, and other economists, what we estimated was the average cost to provide services per acre, uh, facilities, water, sewer, uh, roads, everything else, was about $80,000 per acre for the low density uh, and $400,000 per acre for the, for the high density. Okay, so right away we see that it costs more for the high density uh, than for the low density. And that's been a truism, and that's been maybe one of the driving factors behind some public policy saying, well, we spend less per acre at the low density relative to the high density. Well, we need to take a fresher look at this. So here are the assessed values per acre that I mentioned earlier, uh, and here's the cost to value ratio. 9% uh, of the total value of the two per acre uh, development, half acre development, is devoted to the utility costs, the facility costs, where it's only 3.7% for the higher or the upper missing middle uh, type. Now, the difficult one, we need to understand that uh, new development oftentimes pays its upfront capital costs, and new subdivision pays for its water sewer lines, its roads, and so on and so forth. But the community at large inherits that entire cost and must maintain and repair and replace all of those facilities eventually over time. And that's where these differences in ratios over time catch up to us from a fiscal perspective. Oops. Now, one way we can uh, change some of our planning to address some of these cost issues is through the creation of what we call fiscal analysis zones. And maybe it can be called other things, other places, uh, impact uh, zones or whatever. But fiscal analysis zones can be used to uh, tailor the cost of facilities uh, with respect to the cost of, uh, uh, with, with respect to the density patterns, the land use patterns uh, in a particular community. Uh, so each of these zones would have a level of service standard. Uh, each of these zones would also have its own particular facility plan. Now certainly you can have some facilities sharing being shared by a couple of zones or more. Um, but the costs and revenues will be calculated for each zone using a local improvement district type of approach. And so we can use various uh, taxing and, and fee structures to recover the true cost of development in this zone and in this zone and in this zone and so forth. So we make sure that we achieve a kind of discipline 
in cost based on development patterns for each, each of these areas. We can then also steer development to some areas that are uh, have more capacity for facilities and away from others that might be more sensitive. Uh, we can also use uh, policies to facilitate affordable housing and economic development. So let's take a, another look at this. This is these are actual numbers. Uh, this is these are fiscal analysis zones for a city of about a million people uh, somewhere in the U.S. I won't name names. I just want to make the point. So here's the average cost per new home in each of these fiscal areas. And there's, I forget, there's like their eight or nine uh, FAZs. Uh, this is the average cost per home for new development with the overall average at about almost $5,000 per new home. This is net cost netting out the revenues, the new revenues, this new development already generates from new taxes to go for the same facilities and here's the net difference between what they already generate uh, and what they actually cost. Uh, and so coming to the middle column here, we see the, um, the percent of this to this. Uh, and we see over here to the right hand side, the, the, the highest density area or the lowest cost area actually costs 3.6 times less than the average. Put differently, um, it costs 3.6 times less to serve this particular area here, A, than area I. Now, if we charge all development at $5,000 per unit, what will happen is that these uh, lower cost fiscal analysis zones will pay more than their actual cost. The lower density or the higher cost FAZs will pay less and over time, you'll get more high cost and less low cost development because that's how the economy works. So the benefits in all of this is that we need to find a way through more, more careful calibration analysis of the nature of facilities and services by density and land use patterns to create discipline in the facility planning, financing, and delivery process. Uh, this allows us to improve the link between development costs and revenues. It should also improve political transparency so the politicians, decision makers will know what area costs more uh, than, uh, than another area. Uh, by doing so and then, and then recalibrating our planning and facility infrastructure uh, investments, we should be able to realize lower taxes and fees, thereby increasing income to people and firms. Um, we can then use that uh, those savings to invest in new or improved services to improve to elevate quality of life or a combination of both. So our choices are to lower the taxes or use the savings to improve services or a combination. But unless we find a way to realize these, uh, these benefits from more careful uh, land use, uh, dis uh, density oriented planning and facility planning, we won't get these kinds of savings and that's where we need to go. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, to Kevin uh, Shepard for some more details on this. Thanks, Chris. Let me get my screen shared. Looks like it's lagging just a tad. There we go. So, uh, so both Chris's <laughs> here gave a, a nice intro to this um, to this topic, and um, I guess my, my background, my in, my introduction into this kind of goes back to uh, my time at, at HDR. Uh, I started out my degree or, or my uh, my career as a civil engineer, working on paving, drainage, water, sewer, and then later some some transportation projects. Uh, and then, uh, as was mentioned in my intro. Uh, my last few years there, 2009-ish, uh, right around the, the last recession, so 09 to 2011, um, my last couple of years there, I served as national director of our firm's uh, community planning practice. And so I went from a world of where I was taught as an engineer that growth is good, uh, you know, expansion is good. We're going to design our, our, our roadway systems for, uh, for additional expansion and growth brings residential growth, tax base, economic development. Um, and, and ultimately all of that feeds back into quality of life. 
Uh, but as I saw in those couple couple of years working with the planners, economists um, around the country, I, I started to kind of have this aha moment where no matter where I went, um, big city, small city, urban, rural, suburban, uh, no matter what city you went to, they, they were struggling to find the money to pay for infrastructure and basic services. Uh, there was always this struggle with with how do we keep taxes down for our for our residents, uh, but when we do our our capital improvement programs and and we look at our infrastructure, there's there's never enough money to do everything, and so we end up funding a little bit, we kick more of it, defer more of it to a future year, uh, and the cycle continues and the gaps get bigger. Um, so in 2011, I I made the decision to leave uh, leave that position, start our firm Verdunity. Um, to focus on on helping city leaders align their development patterns, their vision, their policy, their investments uh, with what citizens are willing and able to pay for, not just now, but uh, but over time. Let's see if I can. Uh, so as I've asked folks, city leaders, elected officials, city managers around the country, um, really for the last decade or so, I've been asking this question. Of, of when it comes to growth and, and development in your community, what's your biggest challenge or frustration? Almost all of them will say some version of this. How, how do we address the growing wants and needs of our residents with limited resources? Uh, more specifically, if you dig down a little bit more, they'll say infrastructure. We have to address, we have all of this maintenance and, and we have to address our older infrastructure, but we still have this pressure to add new, to extend our, our roadway, water, sewer systems uh, to accommodate new growth. Uh, so what does that mean? That means, and Chris just hit on this a second ago in his, where, where developers will come in, they'll put in the, the, the development up front, uh, the, the streets, the, the water, the sewer, the parks, and we get that new growth. Uh, from that, we get additional economic growth, new businesses. Uh, but later on, 30, 40, 50, or 60 years later, all of those streets, the parks, the utilities that were put in by developers have to be maintained. And so that, that question is really the, the gist of what I want to talk about here is, is there's a bunch of studies that the smart growth folks have done an excellent job with, with this. Of, there's a bunch of studies that show smart growth and density and different development patterns, more compact development patterns are more fiscally productive. But when you go into a city and you try to work with them to get your land use and zoning criteria changed, or you try to do a road diet or change up your transportation system to look at public transit or more multimodal solutions, uh, my experience for, for many years was we as professionals, as designers would go in and want to do those projects. Uh, but when you get to the end of the game and you get ready to get that development project approved or that zoning code approved or that capital improvement project, that roadway project um, approved to design it, the public will show up and ultimately the, the pressure gets to elected officials and we, um, we bail on it. Uh, and so, so many times I've seen what I would call good projects get derailed because the, the general public and maybe in some cases your elected officials didn't really understand why these changes were needed. And so this idea of, of land use fiscal analysis, what I'm gonna talk about here to, to use it as the common language uh, has been really powerful for us. And I, I wanna explain kind of a few examples of, of how we're using this locally to, to change the conversation in communities and ultimately get the, the outcomes that, um, that have been talked about already. So uh, this slide just shows one of the most basic uh, one of the most basic things that we can do is just quantify at a high level what would it cost to replace our existing street system. Uh, I'm still shocked at how many cities I go to and, and you ask that question and they don't know the answer. They'll, they'll know some version of what their payment study said of, of we have X amount that we have to replace in the next 10 years or we have X amount of dollars to work with and this is how far we can stretch it. Um, but we need to know what that big liability is. What what would it cost if we had to maintain and re or replace our street network right now? Uh, when you do that number, you get big, or when you do that calculation, you get pretty large numbers. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways to to do this and get more detailed uh, with this that we can talk about in the, the Q&A if you guys want to. Uh, another way to think about this, this revenue infrastructure cost gap, specifically with streets, 
Uh, I'm going to focus on streets just because that's a, an easy one to, to think about the relationship between property tax revenue and the, the value of what we build and the, the infrastructure cost. Uh, utility systems are a little different because they're enterprise funds and typically paid with, with a rate structure. Um, but for streets here, let's take this example. This is from Taylor, Texas, a, a community in Texas that we're, we're working with right now. Um, this was a small street reconstruction project, and the cost of the project here was $875,000. Uh, it's an asphalt street, so they're expecting to get about 20 years out of it. Um, the tax revenue, the property tax revenue that they're getting from adjacent properties is a little over $13,000 a year. So just basic calculations here, if, if 100% of that property tax revenue went to nothing but this street, it would take 65 years to pay off that street investment. That's over three times the life of the project. We've done this for hundreds of street projects, cul-de-sacs, wide streets, um, thoroughfares. There's all kinds of different ways you can look at this, but in most cases, uh, the um, we see this, this, and it's not just a small gap, but it's a, a really large gap between the, the property tax value, the, the revenue, uh, that we're getting from this infrastructure investment. And if you think about streets for a minute, um, the whole point of a street investment is we make that investment so that the we can develop that land. Uh, and you would think that the value created from that development would would replace or generate enough to to pay for that investment. Um, but as we see in our budgets, we have we have cities that are spending three percent, five percent, maybe ten percent of their general fund. Uh, revenue on street reconstruction, uh, and it leaves it to sales tax, street fees, um, and bond and debt and, and other strategies to try to close that gap. But when you do this over an entire city, when you be, build street after street after street, that doesn't add up, and then you do it in more of a sprawling pattern like what we see in so many of our, our communities across the country, um, you end up with a significant significant infrastructure funding deficit and we have this at our city level we have it at the state level and we have it at the federal level um, and this idea of smart growth and, and the development pattern i think is is key to it um, this this slide here is this is something that we do in a lot of our comprehensive comprehensive planning work uh, this just shows the the land footprint the annexation over time and you can see from from this example, the, the core, that dark green in the middle was their traditional pattern, kind of pre-World War II, the traditional grid walkable pattern that we started most of our city's development with. And then the yellow, orange, and red shows what happened um, post-World War II, 1950 and on, where we started to expand out quickly. Uh, and, this, um, and in this community, Victoria, Texas, they grew, uh, they grew over 13 times land area in, in about six decades, but their population only grew four times. So basically what that means is you're taking this cost of this infrastructure system, the roadway network, the water, the sewer, and every everything else in your police, fire, parks, libraries, you're taking the cost of that whole system and you're, the cost per person is actually going up because you're, you're taking on more and you're diluting the, uh, the base or, or reducing the, the amount of people to, to cover that cost. Um, so how do we get people, how do we get communities to talk about closing this resource gap? Uh, and it's really, it, it's all about getting them uh, to understand the why. If you can get a community, if you can get the elected officials, the residents to understand why a change is needed, then you can start to open up the conversation about all the great options that are out there uh, to, to close this gap. But uh, in our experience, and you know what I've seen for the last um, the last ten years, it, it is this conversation um, of we we really have to get at this why we really have to get the people to understand the the resource gap and and we view specifically street infrastructure uh, to to hammer that home quickly. Um, so there's three options here: the resource gap. We can keep our our development patterns and service levels where they are. Uh, but we have to charge more, so higher taxes, fees to cover those costs. We see that in some of our older communities where our tax rates are higher. We have street fees, street assessment fees. There's other ways to, to get at that. Um, the second option is you keep your development pattern and your tax rate the same, but you cut services to align with revenues. This is effectively what a lot of our communities are doing right now. Uh, we have that capital improvement program that I mentioned that's $100 million or 
for a billion dollars worth of needs and we fund a small percentage of that and then defer the rest to, to later. When we're doing that, we're intentionally deciding what neighborhoods we're gonna keep alive and which ones are, are gonna continue to deteriorate. Um, nobody really likes that option either. And so this third option is something that Chris touched on as well, which is how do we shift this development pattern and infrastructure design to enable an affordable balance of services and taxes? Uh, and, and using this data, using these kinds of, of tools that are out there now, um, our hope is to, to use this data uh, facilitate discussions that, that help city leaders ultimately align that development pattern, your service, uh, your service model, your tax structure with what residents are willing and able to pay for, not just now, uh, but in the future. So we need this common language so that we can talk about common problems and build common solutions. A lot of normal people out there, you say the word density and they get scared. You say density, they think 10 stories, they think apartments, they think a whole bunch of, of things that that aren't always uh, that aren't always true. Uh, so same thing with road diets and some engineering and, and transportation concepts. But if we can put things in terms of the value of their property, the affordability of their property, their tax rate, the return on their tax uh, investment, they'll start to lean into these conversations a little bit more. So is there a way that we can increase a city's tax base, that we can grow local jobs and businesses, that we can diversify housing types and price points, that we can close the city's resource gap, um, and at the same time, we can increase the wealth of residents and businesses without raising taxes or incentives? Uh, the answer to that is yes, and it's called incremental development, small development. Any of you that have followed Strong Towns or the Incremental Development Alliance, those are two nonprofits doing great work with this that, that I encourage you to to check out. So here's how we use land use fiscal analysis to talk about land use, density, infrastructure, economic development, and housing. Um, first thing is differentiating between appraised value and revenue per acre. These are two maps from Dallas County. Um, the one on the left shows appraised value. The one on the right shows levy per acre. Um, assessed value or appraised value is how we often think of property values. Um, the dark green is is the more uh, the higher values. The the light green and the yellow color in this map is the the lower values. When you flip that and you turn this into levy per acre, you actually take the the property tax revenue um, that that parcel generates and you divide it by the size the size of the parcel. You'll get this metric of revenue per acre. Um, that shows a very different story. If you're if you're familiar with North Texas, if you're familiar with the Dallas area, there's a big conversation about the lack of investment in South Dallas. Um, and you can see here kind of where the, the wealth uh, has gone in terms of up the kind of the, the central northern corridor of, of the Dallas area. Um, when you look at it through this term of levy per uh, levy per acre. Um, here's just comparing a couple of quick examples of the kinds of comparisons that you can do to illustrate how different development patterns perform. These are two similarly sized parcels. Uh, the one on the left is Main Street mixed use, very modest mixed use, one and two story. Um, that area generates a tax revenue per acre of a little under 16,000. Uh, you compare that with a suburban pad site, um, similar similar size area, um, and you get significantly less property tax revenue per acre from that site. Uh, here's another example of a, a little bit bigger scale. Got a traditional grid downtown on the left. Contrast that with the big box on the right, uh, and you can there, you can see the the property tax revenue per acre um, is three about three times as much for that downtown, and that's with one entire block. Uh, there is a civic plaza. It, it's not generating any property tax revenue to the uh, to the city for uh, for that development. So we use this revenue per acre mapping. We can do 2D, we can do 3D to kind of show where the different value um, is. Uh, and initially, that's where we started. We just focused on the revenue side and said, hey, look at these, look at the revenue generation difference between these different development patterns. But that wasn't enough to get most of the policymakers to change. We would get the response of, oh, well, of course your downtown does better, or vertical building, you know, when you have multi-story buildings, of course that does better. But we couldn't get policy change. We couldn't get zoning, zoning codes to change. We couldn't get uh, looking at, at different development, sta um, development standards 
Um, and so we had to take this a little bit further. Uh, and this brings in what, what uh, was just mentioned a minute ago, which is the, the unfunded street costs or that future maintenance. Uh, and how do you account for that? So we have a, a couple of steps that we work through and there's a lot of different levels of detail you can get into this, especially with the cost allocation side. Um, but the general process here is we'll start with that property tax revenue per acre and we map that for all of the parcels in your community so that you can see that revenue per acre, that levy per acre for all of the parcels in your community. The next step down is we map the budgeted costs. So we take, we take the general fund budget costs that are paid for from property taxes and we allocate that back down to the parcels. And so this gives you um, a, basically a profit and loss map for the community or what, what a lot of folks call the red green map. Um, and when you think about a city budget, when, when we do budgeting, the revenues and costs tend to, to line up. So we, we take the, the revenues that we expect to get and we set our costs to match that at the local government level. Um, but this third step is really where the breakthrough is. And this is to say, what would this look like if you considered what you really need to be paying for? So if you consider that future reconstruction cost of the streets, or if you consider um, other other funding source or other other needs that you have, maybe it's additional police and fire, maybe it's parks, libraries, other things that you've been having to cut or defer. Um, most of the time here, we'll stick with just the streets because that's the most basic one. Uh, but we've had some places that have wanted to add in some other costs as well. Uh, but this third step, we'll take those unfunded costs and we'll add those in as well. And this is where you see the big difference in those profit loss maps of here's what development's generating today on current budget costs, uh, but here's which ones are productive and not productive when you factor in the full costs of, of serving them. So let me show just uh, a couple of additional slides to show what this looks like through the, through the whole sequence of this and then how the conversations at the end uh, can change. Um, this is existing street infrastructure for Brownsville, Texas. It's a, about a 200 plus thousand population community down on the, uh, right down on the border that we worked with a couple of years ago. Uh, this is their street infrastructure map. Um, their street replacement costs just at a, at a high level without dialing this down too much, um, was $1.32 billion. So quick estimate to, re to replace all of the streets in their community that they had at the time, they needed over $1 billion. Um, and uh, about half of that, as you can see from this chart, about half of that was in poor condition and needed to be replaced like now. Um, the, other, the other half of that was in decent condition and they had a little bit of time. So. With them, we took that, that uh, 1.3 billion, we spread it over 20 years. That came out to around 66 million a year that they really needed to be spending on street reconstruction. Um, this, isn't, this isn't preventative maintenance or spot maintenance. This is just to reconstruct what you have and planning for it. Um, they were spending, I, I don't remember exactly what, what Brownsville was spending at the time, but obviously there was a, a significant gap between what they were spending on streets at the time and this 66 million a year that they that they needed um, this is what their maps looked like so this was with the current budget uh, this shows what they looked like the green this is a, a return on investment map so if it's green it's generating more um, than it costs if it's red it's it's uh, cost more to serve than it's making this was their current budget and then when we add in the unfunded street maintenance, that's how it changes. So this is kind of perception of how things are doing today. Um, this is what it really looks like when you factor in just those unfunded street costs. Uh, and there's other, um, there's again, there's other costs too that we can work in there as well when you get into different development patterns and the cost of, of the development on the edge versus in the core. That just that exercise right there of showing the difference of those two maps has been a very powerful way to get uh, the conversation kind of off center in terms of, of seeing the need to change. Uh, this is another really powerful way to, to look at this with the analysis that we do is with every model that we do, we can go in after and then we can look at land use or zoning districts, um, different uh, property value ranges, different lot sizes. Uh, and and we can kind of pull out from that how different development patterns are performing for the current budget and then the, the budget plus unfunded street scenario. 
every time that we do this, um, we see the same thing come out, which is that those smaller lots, the, the smaller lots, both on the residential and commercial side, generate a much higher revenue per acre uh, for the back to the city than the larger lots. Uh, we'll do charts like this one and uh, and what you see kind of the, the chart on the left and then the table up there uh, on the top right that, that shows the breakdown for different, uh, different lot sizes. This one's for single family. Um, the other takeaway from this in terms of affordable housing, this has been another really big conversation for us, is um, if you look at that one on the left, those gray bars represent the, the average value or the average structural value on the site. So not only are those small lots that are on the left of this chart, not only are, are those small lots the, the biggest winner to a city in terms of revenue per acre, they're also the most affordable. This trend also shows up on the commercial side. So when we talk incremental development and small developers and local businesses, uh, those small spaces, that 25, that 25 foot lot, you know, 25 by 150, 150 foot deep, that's so common in our core downtowns. That is an excellent place to look at in terms of maximizing value per acre back to the city, an affordable space for a resident or a business to get into uh it's a you know it's a great way to kind of close that uh, close that gap so this is the the last part i'm going to speak to and this is we, we talk about this from two angles of cultivating fiscal health for the community how, how do you kind of grow that revenue per acre so that you can close that revenue gap over time but also how do you cultivate local wealth in your community by um by helping your your residents in the community getting that the, the property that they've invested in to to slowly appreciate in value over time how do you get that small business in there so that they can cultivate wealth how can you get people into an owner occupied kind of building where instead of paying rent to somebody else they're actually owning their building and, and making revenue making money that can be reinvested back into the community and this is where this incremental development concept is just so so powerful um, this is a slide from Taylor, Texas. This shows their map of the, the current budget on the left, uh, the budget plus unfunded streets on the right. Uh, and, and a strategy here for them and, and really a strategy that we recommend in every community that we work with is go back into your core, look at the areas where you have the oldest infrastructure in your community. You tend to have a, a traditional grid street pattern lot, uh, lot layout, which is the, the framework for the highest fiscally, the most fiscally productive um, development, but you also tend to see a, a lot of red in terms of, uh, you know, lots that haven't been or, or neighborhoods that haven't been reinvested in. So they've got deteriorating streets, maybe they've got some blight on them, uh, you know, some vacant lots in there. This tends to be a huge opportunity for cities to go into an area that they, they have to replace or take care of that infrastructure fairly soon anyway. Uh, and they tend to have the smaller lots uh, again, already in place. And so it's just a matter of coordinating investment, public and private, uh, to get redevelopment in these areas. This is just a, a quick example from Pasadena, Texas, that shows what this can look like. Uh, this is an older neighborhood that um, that they're looking to redevelop. They, uh, they're looking to diversify their housing stock across the whole community. And so small projects like this, uh, you can see the difference on the, the bottom right, what Kind of what the existing development looked like before you can see in the top right what they uh, they partnered with a small developer to do they put some smaller they, they cut those three lots into uh, four or five uh, i think and so uh, they got significantly more revenue per acre out of this development they diversified their housing stock a little bit the value of these homes just right when they went in uh, was a little bit more than what was there uh, before, but not uh, not as much as you would think because the lots are smaller. Um, and so just if you do this incrementally over time in your community, you can start to see that resource gap close. And images like this tend to, uh, a lot of folks in communities will look at this and say, yeah, that's not too bad. I wouldn't mind that going in on the street next to me. Or you have a small developer saying, that's exactly what I want to, to build, but the codes don't match it right now. So this kind of fiscal conversation can can really help kind of break down some of those barriers that we've seen uh two last examples from these two are from my friend monty anderson he's with the nonprofit uh, incremental development alliance he's also with options real estate um here in the dallas area 
Um, and he really focuses on this incremental small development of revitalizing existing buildings. Uh, this you see an example, an old um, old building on the left. It was on the tax rolls for thirteen thousand dollar land value when he bought it. Um, he turned that into two owner occupant owner occupant live work units. So a retail space in the front, micro apartment in the back. Uh, it bumped that value to 475,000 on the tax rolls. It added a couple of residential units in their downtown, uh, and it added a couple of small business spaces to get some local folks um, in there. And he set this up as an owner occupant. So both of those building uh, or both of those business owners that are in those front spaces also own the units in the back. And so they're able to rent out the units in the back, use that revenue to help pay the mortgage on the building. And that's part of how you cultivate that local local wealth. This is a bigger scale example, an old manufacturing building um, that was flooded. It, it had dead raccoons and some other nasty stuff in it uh, when Monty bought it. But he flipped this into a, a basically a mixed use building uh, structure. You can see there on the left what it looked like when he bought it. Uh, what he flipped it into on the right it's got a co-working space a brewery a bunch of different a yoga studio a bunch of different businesses in there but again this was an area that the city already had infrastructure was already paying to serve with public safety and, and other services it was a building that was falling apart um, was deteriorating or, or starting to decline on the tax rolls and so the partnership here got this redeveloped significantly bumped the revenue per acre uh, and that additional revenue can start to go back into to closing that city uh, city resource gap. But again, it also provided a, a bunch of opportunities for different uh, different folks to start to own and operate businesses uh, as well. So some final thoughts just for for me. Um, I think you know, there's a lot of studies out there that show that these different these these more dense, more compact development patterns are fiscally productive. Uh, but we still have far too many communities that aren't having that conversation to close that gap. Um, and so we, we've got to put this issue front and center. Uh, and I think the uh, the street infrastructure cost is uh, is the best way to to do that. So I just jump all the way down to four and five there and say this this land use fiscal analysis, it can be, it has been for us a, a very powerful tool to help educate, build consent in the community and then start to use it to inform land use, growth management, infrastructure, zoning, uh, and economic development decisions. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Sean and let Sean talk about the uh, the state level uh, on this. Well, thank you, Kevin. I'm going to show my screen here. Hopefully you can uh, see that PowerPoint. Well, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to, to join you today. I think um, what I'm about to talk about really ties together the previous presentations by Chris Nelson and Kevin Shepard. And just for reference, in Kevin's presentation, the city manager was wearing the red tie. That's what I used to be. I did that for about 20 years. I really enjoyed that work. I might've been a unicorn in that uh, capacity, but um, I really wasn't looking for work elsewhere. And then the Lieutenant Governor in North Dakota tapped me on the shoulder and, and uh, asked if I'd be interested in leading the state's uh, Main Street Initiative. And that's what I'm gonna start with talking about today is the Main Street Initiative. And then I'll close with a new development tool that we're working on that really aligns well with the work that you've uh, just previously heard about from uh, Chris and from Kevin. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, you know, every uh, community, um, I'm sorry, these are a little bit out of order. Um, every community in, in North Dakota and across this nation uh, has opportunities and, and certainly challenges. And one of Gover Governor Burgum's five strategic initiatives is the Main Street Initiative or MSI as I'll refer to it throughout the presentation today. And it, it serves as our primary engagement tool between uh, local leaders and uh, state government. It's a community and economic development program that emphasizes uh, building quality of life as a workforce attraction and retention strategy with goals focused on building local capacity and empowering communities to proactively plan their futures. 
MSI is made up of three components or pillars, uh, which are the healthy, vibrant communities, 21st century workforce, and smart, efficient infrastructure. The first pillar that I'd like to talk about is healthy, vibrant communities. North Dakota is creating 21st century cities with vibrant cores that help to attract and retain talent. These unique places and spaces are a differentiator that helps lead to fiscal health and healthy communities. We focus on the restoration and renovation of historic buildings. They offer a unique differentiator and a renewing sense of place and attaching history and culture, uh, bringing it forward in today's society. The development of mixed use buildings, retail on the first floor, upper floors with apartments or offices or both, create economic efficiency around existing infrastructure and they revive marginalized areas. Revitalizing main streets to be a vibrant hub where communities can come together to live, to work and play. And the creation of walkable neighborhoods where residents uh, can lessen the burden of healthcare costs on taxpayers because there's a lot more walking that goes on in these areas than there are in many of our, uh, what I'll call fringe or, or uh, development. The pandemic is causing a shift in people's priorities surrounding where their places of choice, including their residences. If you review the statistics, there's an urban flight that's occurring from several of our major metropolitan cities across the US, including some of our minor metros. Being a healthy, vibrant community is appealing to this group of people and evidence as to why we pursue these objectives with the Main Street Initiative. The second pillar is 21st century workforce, and North Dakota is economy is changing and now more than ever a skilled workforce is vital to the success of any company big or small in industries like energy agriculture healthcare unmanned aerial systems biotech cybersecurity manufacturing and engineering we're seeing the emergence of new solutions built on innovative ideas and shifting to local control for schools to help students succeed through innovative educational practices offering science, technology, engineering, arts, and math courses to guide learning and meet the needs of 21st century workforce and economy, providing students with the ability to earn college credit while still in high school to jumpstart post-secondary education and career choices and developing roots in North Dakota, supporting project-based learning and public-private partnerships and extending lifetime learning and workforce training and enhancements to improve academic and career skills for adult learners as well as alternative educational options. Many of the individual components of MSI are not new. They are proven and trusted. The third pillar, smart, efficient infrastructure. As a recovering longtime former city manager of the second fastest growing small community in the nation for two years, this is the pillar that intrigues me and, be, and will be most pertinent to our discussion today. Building smart, efficient infrastructure starts by examining the full costs the return on investment and sustainability of growth patterns. From large metro areas to small towns, creating mixed use city centers and neighborhoods maximizes existing infrastructure, a clear economic be benefit for taxpayers, as been outlined with the two previous speakers. This strategy of infilling existing spaces with diverse retail housing opportunities reduces long-term costs for city government, it benefits tourism and business, and fosters the kind of creative spaces, arts, and culture that attract people of all ages. Small, efficient footprints benefit all community members by keeping tax rates low, as you have heard from our previous panelists. Supporting these efforts includes understanding that edge development is increasingly expensive over time as new water towers, sewer systems, street lights, sidewalks, snow plows, garbage collection, all add significant costs without a commensurate tax base. Maximizing existing infrastructure with an infill approach, building new mixed use structures on empty lots or underutilized surface parking lots, even alleyways can become attractive and unique gathering spaces. Building a smart power grid for more efficient power transmission, faster restoration, and reduce uh, operation and management costs. 
<clears throat> and high speed gigabit bandwidth is a must for 21st century communities to accommodate our virtual workplace. While I was a city manager in a very fast growing community, we were confronted with numerous challenges, including how to fund a five-year capital plan that called for uh, a half a billion dollars of new infrastructure in a community of only 20,000 people. We built new wastewater treatment plants, lift stations, water towers, police and fire stations, and plenty of new neighborhoods. We are partners in the construction of new interstate exchanges and other state highway improvements. And we began to look at new ways to determine how to build residents for community infrastructure that serve multiple development areas, including a distance-based charge from treatment. The concept is pretty simple and may be implemented in other states, but it's new for North Dakota. The farther your home is away from a common infrastructure facility, such as a water or wastewater treatment facility, a landfill or water storage, the longer the support infrastructure is to, to, um, to, to pay for that in, uh, or to service that infrastructure. And I'm talking about pipes and, and roadways and sidewalks and things of that nature. In order to connect your residents with that common region-wide infrastructure, should you pay more for that infrastructure? As you've heard today, all developments are unique and treating them as such from a utility billing perspective could be as well. I understand that communities are all using development agreements of some variety to help pay for the initial cost of infrastructure, but what are they doing that is unique to generate revenue to cover the variety of operational costs of that infrastructure? So for instance, are the residents of a development that's eight miles away from a treatment facility in a hilly part of town that requires multiple lift stations and pump facilities and is zoned with large lots, paying the same base rate for that service as the development that maybe is two miles away from the same treatment facility in a relatively flat part of town with no or little need for auxiliary facilities like lift stations. Rather than charge a flat base rate to all customers, should that base rate include charges that reflect the true cost of infrastructure and maintenance based on the operational cost of the infrastructure serving a specific geographic area that also reflects the customer base, basically lot sizes uh, that is using that infrastructure. If there are such vast differences in operational costs, why are these base rates the same? Dynamic pricing has been a private sector fish fixture for years. We all know we pay more for hotels and airline tickets around holidays or large scale events. Heck, you even probably pay more for your favorite color of an item when you pay when you go on uh, online to, to shop. Consumers understand this model. And is it time for the public sector to catch up? I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about what MSI is as an engagement continuum and what it looks like. For a community, engagement in the MSI or the Main Street Initiative is voluntary. A community leader elects to participate. And I'm sure you noticed that I didn't, I said community leader and not mayor or member of a city commission or council or the equivalent in your area. <clears throat> Instead, that community leader could be a newspaper publisher, a chamber of commerce president, or et cetera. The base of power or influence is wide ranging in communities. And we recognize that role-based power may not be as influential of the power of the individual in certain communities. So the local leader that's interested in the Main Street Initiative indicates their desire by participating, <coughs> excuse me, by filling out an online questionnaire, which is reviewed by the Main Street Initiative staff, who then reviews the responses and develops a tentative game plan with the remainder of the MSI team. And we begin to engage other state agencies that may influence or be part of the solution uh, in that community. The local leader is added to our community leader peer network, which allows them access to uh, monthly calls that we have with these local leaders. We receive, they also can receive regular uh, newsletter distributions from the MSI program, and they can participate in regularly scheduled webinars on topics of interest and learning. We then have a virtual uh, call with that leader to review their responses and explain the engagement process. 
Engagement always includes uh, building a local coalition of local leaders who meet in what we call a listening session. Pre-pandemic, all of our listening sessions were held in the community. We have transitioned to conducting these virtual <coughs> or conducting these listening sessions virtually. During a listening session, we walk the local leader through <clears throat> whom we expect to be at the listening session, which includes locally elected leaders like the mayor I mentioned earlier, uh, education leaders, recreation, arts, culture, students, youth, faith community, economic and development leaders, the Chamber of Commerce, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, business leaders, developers, etc. We invite appropriate, we meaning the Main Street Initiative, um, invites appropriate state agencies to be present at the listening session. At the listening session, a member of the MSI team facilitates a community engagement process that's meant to identify local priorities and what unique attributes the community has. The question we try to answer is, what unfair competitive advantage do they have over other communities? We also identify local champions that are willing to work towards the construction or execution of a plan to take advantage of those unfair uh, competitive uh, advantages that that community has. The plan can be as simple as a one-page document or as elaborate as a community comprehensive plan. Local resources and partnerships drive that level of specificity and Commerce supports this process with grant funds provided by what we call the Partners in Planning Grant. We provide matching grants to communities to develop comprehensive plans, economic development and community development diversification plans, and recently we added COVID response category to this grant opportunity. We have two rounds per year and we can fund between five and eight uh, community grants uh, in each round. We've also developed what we call the Vibrancy Grant. These are a standalone grant, but uh, they also can be tied to the Partners in Planning Grant. They're very small grants, micro grants you can call them, intended to operationalize a piece of the broader development plan and to make sure that the plan doesn't sit on a shelf, as they oftentimes do, to engage a team in the plan immediately to take advantage of those local champions that were identified during the listening session, and to achieve a quick success to build confidence um, and momentum in the broader plan objectives. So in the interest of time, I just wanna close this slide by saying we host several regional convenings across the state annually that focus on broader issues affecting several communities in that area and try to elicit collaboration between communities to accomplish forward momentum towards solving regional issues. And we also host an annual summit where we lift up those communities who have established a best practice that may be replicated in other communities by issuing Main Street awards. I wanna to close today by talking about uh, the North Dakota New Development Calculator or ND2C. Many communities have uh, aging infrastructure along with decreasing populations in North Dakota, and they're no longer able to afford to maintain their existing infrastructure, uh, such as roads, sewer, et cetera. There are development pressures that influence communities to build on greenfield rather than infield. The Main Street Initiative gives community le leaders direct access to technical assistance and project development guidance from the Commerce team, along with other partner organizations. And we're also a conduit of communications between state agencies and the communities that we work with and those local leaders. So one of our big focuses now is sharing our new tool, the North Dakota Development Calculator, with our communities. This tool provides an overview of the impacts of development and sprawl. It operations, operationalizes the similar conclusions that you've heard earlier today from Chris and from Kevin. Sprawl is easy to do in North Dakota because land is cheap and almost everyone has a vehicle. We also allow special assessments in North Dakota, and they are frequently used to subsidize the cost of new infrastructure, which disincentivizes local governments from limiting sprawl. This contributes to a preference for greenfield development, particularly in our larger communities. Meanwhile, there's a lack of capacity in our smaller communities because they don't have specialized staff like city planners or city engineers to thoroughly analyze project proposals. 
understanding the long-term costs of infrastructure is challenging, and especially in these lower capacity communities. And moreover, there's a lack of incentive for decision makers to think long-term about costs. ND2C addresses these issues. Communities can plug specific details about how a potential project into a tool. For instance, how many feet of a new arterial roadway will be constructed? How many single family homes will be serviced by that roadway? They can also add any commercial mixed use buildings, et cetera, so that we're getting both a revenue and a uh, cost side of the pictures. ND2C then estimates the project costs and revenue over a 30 year period. The costs of building, repairing, and maintaining infrastructure, the revenue generated from property taxes and or sales taxes is included. Now our aim is, is not necessarily to give specific numbers about project costs, but it's more intended to, to convey the magnitude of the fiscal impact as compared to the potential revenue generation and begin a conversation about the difference. Now we, we were lucky to, uh, to have a Harvard fellow uh, come to North Dakota and help us develop this tool. We vetted it with um, cities and communities in North Dakota and some of our nationwide partners like Chris Zimmerman on our call are on our panel today. Um, we've also vetted it with our State Department of Transportation or in the process of sharing this tool with our MSI communities. We currently consider this a, a beta test and we hope that once it's utilized in some of our MSI communities that we can better refine the tool, roll it out statewide, and inform communities about the cost of sprawl and encouraging them to make more informed decisions. Our October MSI Summit will focus on infrastructure, and that is when we intend to roll out the tool, including an, an, an app that will uh, allow people to more easily engage with that tool. Whoops. So with that, I'd want to say thank you very much for allowing me to share information on what North Dakota is doing to help our municipalities achieve better long-term outcomes. I will, if you have any questions following today, my email address is, is up there. Uh, our website is up there. Feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to connect. I want to thank you so much for listening, for uh, inviting me to be, participate in the panel. And I'd like to turn the platform back over to Michael.
Uh, hi, this is Chris Zimmerman. I hope people can now hear me. Uh, I'm sorry about that loss of audio. Um, thanks very much to uh, Sean and Kevin and Chris. We would like to begin taking some questions. Um, and I, I don't know if Michael's uh, been able to reconnect his audio, uh, but let me start with a, a first question and um, ask um, Chris, you there? You're muted. I think the uh, console has crashed. <laughs> That's it. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. I yeah, don't. No? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It seems like our console has crashed. So apologize for that. That's never happened before. And I was just on the phone with John Coleman to try to see if we can actually get this back up and going again. But it looks like it's still on. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and ask a couple of questions of the panelists while we try to fix things? Yeah, it looks like Chris is muted. All right, how about now? Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about can that. Can you hear me there now? Is. There you go, Chris. Go ahead. He's there. Yes. He's flipping it on and off uh, at the other level, at the other end. So um, I did have a question. Let's see if I can get it out before I get remuted again. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, starting with Kevin, uh, what policy change would you recommend that local governments undertake to implement the uh, approach to fiscal sustainability that you described? So basically, what action could local governments do anywhere in America now that would make a difference that would be a good step to getting to where you want? And I'll ask the others to think about it as well. But Kevin, could you start? <clears throat> Boy, just one, huh? Um, well, I think um, number number one would be maintenance first. So fo focus, I mean, when you look at your city budget, focus on, on maintaining what you have first. Um, I think doing a fiscal impact analysis on any new development is is critical and making sure that that fiscal uh, analysis includes the the future reconstruction costs not just the the analysis on the on the upfront um, and then the third um, and this is kind of a, a wish list but or, or a, a little more of a wish but i i think if cities could just go to um you know to two stories across the board i mean just two-story buildings would make a huge huge impact um we could get into parking, getting rid of, of minimum parking requirements. There, there's a bunch of them that come out of this, but um, I, I, I've gotten that question before, Chris, and, and I, I'll find people want to kind of jump into a, a detail and want to talk about parking or density or lot size or something like that without, I, I just, I guess my, my big takeaway or recommendation would be to have the big overall conversation in the community about the long-term costs of this stuff. Because if you don't, like I said in, in my part of the presentation, if you don't talk about the why up front, you can talk about some of these more specific recommendations, but it just, you'll have trouble getting it across. But but when people understand that there is a big cost coming to maintain where they're living and they're going to be on the hook to pay for it, their their opinion will change. Most people's, at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, those are a lot of good things to start with. Um, Chris Nelson, part of what I'm thinking about here is, you know, how do we get local governments to more systematically be asking these kind of questions uh, and getting the kind of answers, the kind of information that, for instance, Kevin showed that he's supplied to a number of them that he's worked with? What are your thoughts? Well, I have two thoughts. One is uh, maybe on the planning side. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So, one is um, an inventory and assessment of existing land uses. Um, we developed this uh, model in uh, at Utah when I was there some years ago. We took the assessor records, plotted them uh, around the county, and then we used um, an off-the-shelf estimator of the useful life of structures. Um, and then we plotted the age of structures 
by the land, by the land areas. And we generated a, a heat map, if you will, showing those parcels of land that had structures that were already beyond their useful life. And then those structures that would be uh, go beyond their useful life in five-year increments to 20 years. And we actually discovered a whole swath of uh, corridors and such where existing buildings were already beyond their useful life or close to it, which would give us a chance to round up the property owners, round up the neighbors, and talk about the next step and generate a sector plan. If, uh, this simple exercise opened up eyes. People could visually see, oh, okay, these corridors are right for redevelopment now, but they're not being redeveloped because of zoning or infrastructure or whatever the reasons are. And by the way, that corridor down the street in five years will be in the same situation. What can we do now as a collaborative planning process to figure out the barriers and figure out how to jumpstart redevelopment that is already past due. Um, then there's a second more mechanical part. Uh, I've been working with uh, Chris Zimmerman and Spark North America on a, a model ordinance that would uh, provide the, the framework for uh, evaluating uh, basically all development, but essentially new development for its uh, fiscal impacts on the community, touching on a lot of these uh, concepts that Sean and Kevin actually uh, I can elaborate on it on in, in great detail. In fact, I really enjoyed Sean's presentation on, about the distance-based costs. I'd like to get more information about that if I could myself. I'd like to note, since you mentioned it, Chris, that uh, we'd expect uh, that early next year, SGA will be releasing uh, the model ordinance that uh, Chris Nelson just talked about, um, along with some other material that he and his team worked on that I think will be of interest to people interested in these issues. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that, uh, hopefully in January. Um, Sean, do you have microphone access? Yes, I do. Oh, great. Um, so <laughs> perhaps you want to address like from the standpoint at the state level, um, you know, what, what, you'd, what you'd like to see happen and what you'd think that, you know, if you're advising other states as well, what at the state level they should be thinking about. Obviously, you've described some of the things you're already doing there, but. Yeah, I think it boils uh, down to proactive planning. Um, and the reason that I mentioned that is because the proactive planning, it does involve those community conversations that I think are at the heart of, of even Kevin and, and uh, Chris's um, presentations as well. Um, you, trying to achieve alignment by engaging um, your residents uh, will, will help smoothen that path. Um, and if, especially if it's a comprehensive plan, um, in my opinion, you have to start with land use. No, no city is, is the same. And so growth patterns change over the course of time. Uh, the first community that I was a city manager for was a slow growth community and our issues were much different. They revolved around uh, how to pay for maintenance, um, how to replace certain infrastructure that's been in place for quite some time. The community I worked in second, you know, was very fast paced. And so the, the, there it was all about um, taking advantage of the infill that, that's there before you start moving to your extremities because uh, that's where everybody uh, liked to go because it's a blank slate. And with, with North Dakota's use of special assessments, um, it was almost looked at as, as free development. And so, so be very cautious about free uh, or at least, uh, and, and in my opinion, go start with a comprehensive plan that includes land use and zoning as components of it. Very good. Um, thanks. And, and I, you know, I particularly value your perspective because you've seen it both ends, right? Because you've done the local government work and, you know, now you're seeing it from the state side. Um, I, I guess I should let people know we are going a bit over to accommodate uh, some questions. So we'll be going a little bit longer. And uh, Michael, if you're there, do you uh, have a few of the questions from the audience? Sure. And I uh, apologize for the technical difficulties as I just uh, broadcast through the chat function that looked like the console uh, crashed for John Coleman and I. So we both got kicked out briefly. So apologize for that. So and we have gotten many, many, many questions here. And it looks like we may have lost a bit of the audience while we uh, were transitioning back. But I apologize for that. But thanks to everybody for being part of it today. 
Okay, so I'm just going to read uh, one that has a bit of a comment and a question here, and then we'll we'll move forward. Um, and it's from Rick Ryback, who says some communities are creating economic incentives to reduce sprawl by reducing the tax rate applied to privately created building values, while increase, increasing the tax rate applied to publicly created land values. The lower rate on buildings makes them cheaper to construct, improve, and maintain, and the higher rate on land value keeps the land prices low by reducing profits from land speculation. Um, are the panelists aware of this tax shift policy that creates economic uh, incentives for more affordable infill developments? So if I understand this correctly, it's almost like a uh, Henry George tax approach. Back in the late 1800s, a, a British uh, business person uh, thought that we should have only a property tax. Uh, and actually, the higher the tax, the better, because it would force the owners of property to use the property more efficiently. And he wouldn't tax improvements. Um, so if you built your uh, structure, you were taxed only on the land uh, and not on the improvements. So this almost sounds like that kind of approach, or maybe a hybrid approach, um, and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy based in Cambridge, Massachusetts is really an international leader in this whole area of land value taxation following the Henry George um, concept. It's not perfect, but it is actually proven to be better than the current uh, system we have in place. So I think yeah. they're on the right track there. I'd, I'd add to that besides saying, hi, Rick, um, that uh, <laughs> first of all, Henry George is not British. You know that he's an American. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Philadelphia. He ran for mayor of New York City. Uh, and there are, were a few communities that actually adopted his approach of land value taxation then. A couple of them still exist. Um, the state of Pennsylvania has probably done more than any state uh, with a number of municipalities that have for years have had some approach to land value taxation. Not 100% on land, but splitting it so the land is taxed at a higher rate than the improvements. Um, so I think this is an approach that potentially helps uh, in many ways. It's not necessarily something that's an option for most local governments under their state law, uh, but it is something that's uh, been looked at a number of times and I think has some promise. Well, if I could weigh in, uh, in North Dakota, we have what we call renaissance zones, and this is slightly different than the question, but what it does is it allows a community to uh, choose a geographic area. Those blocks are limited by the state, um, so I'll just randomly use 25. You can pick 25 blocks within your community uh, wherever you choose those to be, most communities choose their downtown. You draw the circle around or the oblong or well, whatever it looks like. And what it does is it provides an incentive then for the local government to provide up to a five-year tax abatement on improvements of any buildings uh, that are made within that, um, that boundary. And then the state participates by providing up to a five-year state income tax uh, abatement um, for any improvements or, or revenue generated from improvements uh, on those sites. So it's more of an incentive base um, than it is a taxation method as, as the question asked, but uh, it's, been, it's proven to be quite popular in, in North Dakota. And if you can get those incentives as well as taxes aligned with these locational goals, then you're gonna be moving in the right direction. So I think that's a, another good example of the kind of things that can be done. Michael, you got another one? Thank you. Yes, we do. We have many more, but we'll go to about three Eastern if we can. Um, next one is from An Adam Mormon, who says, uh, will local and regional municipalities be the cause of the next housing bubble? They seem to know better than the actual consumers of what type of and size of houses people want. This forces a lack of diversity of population and housing types and arbitrarily setting higher home prices and larger homes to meet minimum home prices. Who wants to respond to that? I can start. Um, so, you know, I think the general point here is that the rules that local governments set um, have an influence over the housing stock that we have. And because they were mostly set in an era a few generations back, those don't necessarily match what demand is today. And, you know, so I think that part of, you know, what the person is asking is, is, is a good point. Um, one of the things we need to do, and this was emphasized particularly by Chris Nelson's presentation, you know, is get ourselves so that our, our, our rules and our, our um, incentives are permitting the, the market to meet the demand. 
um, when we make it very hard to create a housing supply that meets the demand, you know, we're going to distort the market, and that's what we've done. So we've got you know lots of single-family detached houses on large lots, and you know it's fine. People, there are people who want them. There will always be people who want them, and that's fine. The trouble is we've made it real easy and cheaper to do that than to provide what we have an increasing demand for, given our changed demographics, you know, which is more of the missing middle as well as multifamily kind of housing. Um, so you know we are distorting that market, and we're seeing that reflected in market prices all around the country in communities large and small. Uh, as the first part of it, do I think that you know that would create a bubble? No, because that's not enough for that. Uh, but what it is, is essentially a drag on the market responding to the changing demand that we have in our society. And I could, I'll, I'll build on that a little bit, Chris. I think the <clears throat> the conversation that I'm having in, in a lot of local communities is, um, cities, local governments, and, and maybe even counties as well, when you have development happening out in the county, Sydney's need a, or, or these cities need a, a language and a tool to kind of push back on the developers a little bit and, and say, hey, you know, would you take this business deal? Or, you know, we're inheriting this this infrastructure from you. We've got to pay for it down the road. Um, it just it just opening up that dialogue to to kind of get towards a more uh, mutually <laughs> uh, beneficial uh, development pattern in, in in so many places they don't have that they don't have that language or they don't have the political will they're afraid of you know, if we change this this development too much then we'll we'll lose the market and the developer will go to the community next door um, and that's where it becomes a regional conversation um, it's all of this is connected of of you know federal state county county local um i don't know that the housing bubble is going to necessarily be impacted but i know uh, there are more and more communities that that have street infrastructure that was put in in the 60s 70s and 80s that is falling apart and when the streets fall apart the the wealth moves out and you know where that you know where that goes so um and you know, I don't, I don't want to pretend to know what that's going to mean in the future as far as where people move to. But, but this, this conversation, you know, five years ago, it, it really wasn't happening in communities as much. But, um, boy, I've, I, I've seen it, I've seen it really open up. Even here in North Texas, where we have a lot of new growth, still is that that conversation about how do we maintain the older neighborhoods is starting to climb up the food chain and, and you see conversations about street assessment fees like you know I, I get asked that a lot and I've been talking with some folks in Bismarck Sean about some of that and are street assessment fees the the right way to go or can we undo that and go to it it's just it's a fascinating conversation when you think about just aligning the development so that it's cost effective for developers but also um, makes sense for the taxpayers you know, down, down the road so that we don't have to look to the feds and say, hey, come give us a big subsidy to help us fix all of our cities. Excellent. Michael, you got another one? Yes, we do. Uh, this one's from Christopher Keller who asks, can, and I think it was uh, aimed at uh, Chris Nelson. Um, can the fiscal analysis be done on a more granular basis, say by lot? That would seem to be more equitable if the development is not not monolithic. Yes, actually, it can be done lot by lot. Um, it's uh, especially with the technologies we have these days. Um, you can actually, I've done this from now on home. Uh, you can generate a model that goes lot by lot. Um, but I think that the, it's more appropriate maybe by, um, you, you get to, you know, if you do a lot by lot in a particular small area, um, you get neighbors versus neighbors. Uh, which is never a good thing. You need to bring neighbors together. Um, and as a matter of fact, I just want to do a, a little side thing here. When we did our um, heat map for the ripeness for conversion, as we called it uh, in Utah some years ago, we decided to remove uh, single, we, uh, all residential properties because we didn't want to identify particular homes that should be torn down and replaced and therefore create political conflict. What we wanted to do is focus on the non-residential property, which actually is, uh, it ages faster and is more appropriate for redevelopment along commercial corridors anyway. 
Um, and so that way we identified the commercial properties that needed to be redeveloped. And we, got, we had the commercial developers, commercial property owners on our side by saying, yeah, help us redevelop, help us make more money. Um, but no, you, the short answer is you definitely can use current technologies, current information to generate a uh, parcel by parcel analysis. Now, um, having said that, you, you don't want to go into person by person impact because then you might get into a, a house that has two kids in school and they have whopping expenses on the system but they're only 20% of the households in the neighborhood, let's say, or the community. So you need to be, uh, you need to sort of be mindful of not so much the occupants of the home, but the home structure, the home age, the home location, the lot size, and, and focus probably more on the utility costs and not so much on, say, the school costs. Yeah, I, I would just build on that, and I, it is, you know, it's possible, especially especially with property tax, to to get down to the lot level, and we've done that a little bit. But I think the the most impact happens when you look at just kind of the um, the development patterns of look at all the lot sizes of this type across the whole community, or look at all of this zoning district across the whole community. Um, look at uh, when you start to talk about larger cities, you, you do get into to mapping those those service costs down at different service areas. You know, some some service costs would apply to the whole community. Some can be locked into a smaller service area. Um, I think that's where we're going to head. Is you're going to see you're going to kind of to to use Chris's term of those kind of fiscal assessment zones or or whatever you you were calling those, Chris, of of looking at that service area and saying you know, if if you choose to live in this development pattern with this type of service cost, here's what you have to pay. If you want to live in this kind of development pattern, you know, and, and have this ability to pay, here's, here's how that, that aligns. And I think that's ultimately the path that's going to go, that we're going to move toward. And I just, there's a lot of things that you've got to navigate to get there. <laughs> just like with the land, the land value tax that, that Rick Ryback brought up. I think that's a great place to go, but there's a lot of things you have to unwind to get there. Great, thanks, Kevin. I guess our next question here is from Andrew Gray, which who asks, uh, would the development of the comprehensive plan and any updates be an appropriate time to do the life cycle cost analysis being discussed? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 And yes. That's that's the per that's what we found. That's the perfect time to do it because that typically a comprehensive planning process is that time that you get elected officials community organizations, residents, businesses, all in on that engagement process. And the, the difference is if you don't do this, you're going to you're gonna have a comprehensive plan that's based on dreaming and what do you want to be when you grow up and what city do you want to look like without the reality side of it versus if you come in and start with, here's our liabilities, here's our obligations, here's what we're committed to provide to serve existing residents and businesses first, and then, you know, and, and here's the fiscal impact of different development and, and land use and zoning as we go forward. It, the, the conversation changes quite a bit in a, in a good way. So it's a, that's a great place to, to do this. Well said. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one is from John Crowley, who says, uh, when you evaluate the ad valorem value per acre, do you also evaluate the retail set a retail sales tax value per acre. What brought that up was Kevin's downtown versus big box where the sales per square foot likely greatly exceeds the downtown per foot and therefore may prove more valuable as well, although to the county rather than the, the municipality. Let me just start um, and, and say that this is uh, often a frustrating a matter when we're working in various places in the country because of course the dependence upon property tax varies it's the you know the single most important tax at the local level, but that's not uniformly true. And we do have you know states in this country where cities are dependent more on sales tax, and they may not get the property tax, and so on. Um, and the part that's frustrating because in, there's no reason you can't do this work with you know any kind of tax, except that the data can be a lot harder to get. Um, the property tax data is generally available pretty publicly. The sales tax data is generally pretty proprietary. And um, so it, it can be more difficult to do 
And I might put this on my list of things where uh, states could be helpful in facilitating more of this work for local governments, uh, because frequently you'd need an agreement from the State Department of Taxation to get, you know, anonymized data or something like that. So you can do this kind of analysis. Um, but that, that's the main thing I'd say is that uh, it, it is a key point in a lot of places, especially. And ideally, we would have a comprehensive look at all the taxes, you know, associated with any activity. Uh, but actually, easily getting that data can be an issue. I'm sure Kevin and, and Chris uh, will have thoughts on that too. Well, I've dabbled in this in a couple of past lives. Um, there are ways in which you can, Kevin is smirking, I could, can probably share stories. Um, what I would normally do is um, I would look at the business licenses, which are public, to find the kind of uh, activity occurring. Uh, then I could use, uh, the ULI used to publish uh, sales per square foot for certain kinds of activities. And uh, in fact, those data, can, you can still get those data from various places. So you'd come up with a sales per square foot estimator by type of firm uh, in your local jurisdiction. And then of course, you know the tax rates. Uh, you get that from the state and they can uh, zero out the, the state share and look at the local share and so on and so forth. And you can estimate the tax. It would be, we, we are careful in not saying that this particular property generates this sales tax revenue, uh, just for the reasons I mentioned earlier but we would aggregate them for areas, neighborhoods, or types of land uses. And it got us, you know, it was okay. You know, we got close enough. Uh, I don't know if Kevin adds, does that for his analysis and adds that as a revenue source for the uh, commercial property, but I know that is, a, that is an issue with these kinds of analyses. Yeah, I think with, um, I mean, in the property tax states, I, I like to focus on, um, I like to focus on this relationship between the, the development pattern um, and property tax and streets because I, in my mind, I think the, the development that you're putting on should pay enough to pay for the streets serving it. Um, and, and really, I mean, when you have a productive development pattern in terms of property tax, that frees up your sales tax revenue to go back towards economic development and quality of life, parks and other things as it was originally intended to, to do. And, you know, so that I mean, in volatile, we all know sales tax goes up and down, right? And so in good times, you've got extra and in tight times, you don't have as much. Um, and in a lot of communities now, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're dependent on that sales tax to uh, overly dependent on it, I guess. We, we have looked at this a little bit. It's for everything you guys just said, it's harder to do, especially down at a parcel level. Um, but if you think about it, um, we've got a couple that, that I'm talking with some local folks here in Texas about helping us do some detailed modeling on this, but the general feeling is, is it kind of follows the same trend of the more people you put in an area, the more commercial demand you're going to have and more commercial demand generates more retail tax. It's just a, it's a different development pattern. So instead of that one big box generating X number of jobs and sales tax, you're getting that same number of jobs and sales tax from, you know, 20 small businesses. Again, if, if you've got community support to go, visit those kind of kind of businesses and 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 I'm careful too we're, we're really careful to say no one development pattern is better than another um, but at the end of the day the development pattern needs to bring enough in for your city to pay the bills and right now it's not and it's the the big the big boxes that development pattern is not going to help you close the close the gap in a resilient way I'd add to what Kevin said you know so the the property look is important in part because that's based on the land value and actually land value is a large part of what we're talking about right um so you know that that's always going to be important we recently did some work in uh, michigan with a city that's really income tax dependent which is less common in this country but um you know is for some municipalities and so we actually had to approach it from that point and that brings up some you know again interesting wrinkles in, in how you have to do the estimation but uh that you know again that so the basic answer to the question is yes you can look at these other things at least in principle and I just, I just to add to that, Chris, I think there's a there's a level here that a general analysis can get you, you know, pulling in examples like this presentation and and examples from other places can can get you to a point. But if you really want to have the data to make policy decisions and land use and zoning decisions, you've got to have a very a localized model that really you know allocates your service costs accurately 
uh, because somebody's going to come in and want to poke holes at it. <laughs> yep. John, you probably know that from both sides. <laughs> yeah, I was I was just going to say <clears throat> that's exactly what our biggest concern is, and um, and what we find the most difficult is trying to put the costs in as they relate to police and fire and and services such as that, uh, and because those can all be um, like you said poked holes in. Um, but our our calculator is trying to um, put together the, all of the expenses, whether they are regional or uh, what I'll call citywide uh, in our, our calculator. Um, sales tax in North Dakota, there is a, of course a statewide sales tax, but in North Dakota you have to become, um, you have to obtain special authority by your local uh, folks. Uh, they have to pass a, a resolution of support. Uh, and if you don't have that, you can't charge local sales tax. So there's a, there's a variety, there's an inequity, I'll call it, amongst uh, uh, communities across North Dakota. It, because they don't all have access to the same revenue streams. So building a tool that reflects even that local environment is becomes more difficult. Great, thank you. We'll ask a couple more here and then we'll we'll conclude by having everybody give their kind of uh, final thoughts. Here's another question and there's so many I apologize we won't be able to do this do them all. Maybe we'll want to do a separate Q&A session with you all. Um, has anyone actually been successful yet with the differential taxation or differential utility fees suggested here? Though supremely logical, I'm curious about the receptivity at the community level. There are examples, as I said, a number of municipalities in Pennsylvania have done it for a long time. Um, there are, you know, a few places here and there. There are also some examples that are less explicitly, you know, Henry George-ish but which uh, you know in effect do the same thing by you know having special districts with um, you know differential taxation on that basis I mean even for instance uh, although it wasn't necessarily aimed exactly this way in Virginia you know in, in the recent transportation legislation about five or six years ago now I guess um, they made it possible to have a kind of a local add-on tax for transportation purposes which had the effect in places in which it applies uh, like here in Northern Virginia um, to give you know certain you know difference in taxes for um, uh, you know different kinds of it's almost like classification even though it's really not classification um, but you know I think there are other examples as well I don't know if Chris or Kevin or Sean know of any well there are examples I I'd like to actually study them uh, better there's a Cleveland has long had a very fine-grained uh, differential in their water and sewer rate structure uh, in Denver as well. Um, what we haven't done, I, you know, I haven't done anyway, is look at whether they've actually affected uh, land use patterns. Uh, uh, I suspect they would, but it would take a fair amount of longitudinal data collection and analysis. Uh, maybe that's another grant we should apply for. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, I think I'll ask one more question before we move on. Uh, uh, to, the, to wrap up here, since I'm just looking at the time. Um, I apologize, this has been a little messy on our end today. Um, okay, I guess the last question is mainly for Chris, but maybe others can add to it too. Um, how do you equate right-sizing future development with the cost of existing development? Should those living in older developments that may not be right-sized be penalized with higher assessments or fees to equalize the public cost. I guess you're talking to this, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. I was, Chris, hoping, I was hoping the other Chris. <laughs> Apologize. No, that's fine. Um, I thought about that actually. Um, it, it, if you, let's say tomorrow morning, we started a brand new pricing scheme for the whole community to write price everything. Um, I'm not so sure that's a smart thing to do. Um, we live in a political world, and I'm not so sure that you want to make instant um, political enemies of longtime residents and business owners by doing something so drastic overnight. Um, you can have an implementation scheme, a 20-year scheme for that matter. Um, I think that what would be useful is to get the numbers and to see where you're at uh, and understand the effect, uh, the implications of different land use patterns and different properties on your fiscal structure, 
and just know that and then work towards long-term right pricing and long-term right sizing. Uh, I think a lot of the things that Kevin and Sean were talking about sort of get us head us uh, toward that direction. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna end. That's that's my sort of uh, uh, concluding comment when when that time comes. Okay. I think that time may have come. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think we did. I, I'll start with that then. Um, we're we're in this planning game for the long term. Uh, let's understand the numbers. Let's understand demographic change. Let's understand changing preference patterns. Uh, let, let's understand where we're headed and, and, and maybe how, and hopefully how best we get there. But I'd like to think that even in the worst places in this country, in terms of stagnation and decline, we still have the luxury of time. Nothing's going to happen anyway tomorrow morning. But if we have a long-term plan that um, address that, uh, that is based on all the information we have available, we can begin working towards achieving a better right-sized, right-priced future. Um, and after all, you know, these plans are 20 years, 30 years, or so forth in their vision. That's the blink of an eye. Um, I just want to, when I used to live in Alexandria, Virginia, and I, that's where I got, first got to know Chris Zimmerman, uh, there was a place called um, Sherlington uh, in Arlington County. Um, and it's, this was a terrible uh, waste of land uh, at the intersection of two terrible streets uh, with terrible land uses on them. Um, and over a 20 year planning process, uh, this area emerged into a, a gem of a redevelopment that had thousands of people living in it, that had a million or so square feet of commercial retail spaces, two million square feet, um, that was generating all kinds of revenue. But more importantly, it became a real place. Uh, it took 20 years, but that's the blink of an eye in this world. I think we need to think, you know, time is on our side if we get our planning right at the front end. I can, um, I'll go next. I, I think I would I would build on that and say, you know, when you're looking at your long-term uh, plans, even when you're looking at your budget, I, I think make sure you're thinking about life cycle infrastructure costs and how you're gonna pay to, um, you know, to for the reconstruction piece. And then there's all kinds of th things that we can do right now, today, tomorrow, working incrementally to, um, like, like I, I said in my part of the talk, to, to add missing middle housing, to add spaces for small businesses that are more affordable spaces. And, and those are typically in existing neighborhoods and in exist, existing areas where we're already, we already have the services. So by doing those incrementally, just stitch those together over time, you'll start to You'll diversify your housing. You'll diversify your strengthen your tax base. Uh, you'll make your community more local. You know, more unique, more resilient. Um, and at the same time, the the other big one, and this is the engineer in me, just we gotta think about the the fiscal costs of of sprawl. I I, I know a lot of people kind of debate that smart growth term and all that stuff, but but just the the huge cost at a local, city, county, state, and federal level. To continue to expanding out, even like Sean said, in Texas is the same way. Land is cheap in that regard, but the infrastructure to get to it is not cheap. So that's that's a big shift as a country that that I think we've got to start the policy discussion yesterday, which we, we are. We're just not all the way through it yet. That's Chris. That's your job, man. <laughs> well, if I could if I could go next, so that I don't have to anchor uh, and let Chris anchor, I appreciate that. Um, I, I couldn't agree more, I think, with Chris Nelson's comments about comprehensive planning. Um, the timeline on comprehensive planning is, is tough because it often involves you know, the city at its core, and that's uh, driven by elected leaders who work on mostly four-year increments of time. And so getting a long-term comprehensive plan, uh, depending on what that definition is, is tough to go more than 10 or 20 years. Um, but I would suggest if you can get at least 20, that would be um, a, a good place to start. But uh, and make sure that there's a component plan, um, uh, land use and zoning with that, uh, if you can, because uh, I think that will help help drive that timeline out there a little bit further. 
um, so that people really understand the impacts of of what local zoning mean on the on the broader uh, broader tool, and um, two two additional points. Number one, data driven. You, you know, you you can't come to the table without the data. Don't start the process without the data. Make sure that you anticipate uh, uh, questions and process, and and that you have um, your data available uh, right away. Um, and then the next would be uh, move to engagement rather than communication. Communication can be one way. I'm talking to you. Um, where engagement is a process that we talk together. You listen, I listen. Uh, make sure you're at engagement and not at communication. That's That would be my uh, few comments. Thank you, Sean. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Sean, Kevin, and Chris for their participation today and for sharing their insights. Uh, I think this is a really important issue for uh, governments at all levels to be thinking about for all the reasons you've heard. and. Given the participation today, the size of our audience, I'm glad to see there are a number of other people out there who think it's really important. Um, and I think the question, in many ways, um, for me, is how we go beyond the conversation that we've been having, as you know, Kevin said, you know, it's been going for a while now, and get it to a level of policy implementation. I said at the outset, you know, the question for me is how do we get to better policy as a matter of practice? So we need new tools, and new tools are being developed. As you know, Kevin's you know, described their work. I talked a little bit about the work we do with communities at Smart Growth America. Um, you know, there are a number of different folks out there who can help you do this stuff. The question is, how do we get use of those kind of tools to be routine? And of course, what what Sean is doing uh, with Governor Bergman in North Dakota is intended, you know, to get that out as more of a routine thing uh, across their state. This, I think, is the continuing discussion that we need to have going into next year, particularly as communities and local governments, state governments, all try to figure out how we dig our way out of you know, the, the hole we're in now uh, with uh, the pandemic and the resulting economic turmoil. So that's what I'm going to be looking for going forward, and that's also why, as I noted earlier, uh, we'll be releasing something on this and uh, you know, with a, a model ordinance as a basis for discussion. You know, it's uh, it may or may not be exactly, you know, we, there's no one size fits all uh, in ordinances, but hopefully it will be the basis for the beginning of a discussion so every community can figure out the best way for them to get to more sustainable long-term outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the short-term thinking that often prevails as, you know, was noted um, because we have, you know, usually no more than four-year terms in American government. Uh, can be a bit of an obstacle, but many local officials do think long term. Some stick around a while. I served 18 years myself, and you know, so I had the tendency to think I'm going to be voting on a budget quite a few years down the road if I stick at this for a while, and you know, I'm going to live in the community afterwards. So I don't want it to be a mess, and you know, that did motivate me, and I think it motivates a lot of uh, elected officials out there who think about what's the community that their children and grandchildren are going to get going to be like. We need to find ways to give them these tools and help them to implement them to get better long-term outcomes for everyone. Thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody. With that, we'll conclude our webinar today, The Fiscal Benefits of Smart Growth. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to our panelists for a great discussion, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And with that, we'll ask you to keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars. Have a great day. Thank you.